I'm going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and get, get started. And, and you are more than welcome to take pictures and share afterwards. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you a quick introduction of our guest. And so today you, uh, you are presente. And so that's what matters, that we all are here. And, and so my name is Saidi Herrera Orellana. I am the Multicultural Officer for the Oklahoma Historical Society. This is the state agency that is in charge of collecting, preserving, and sharing the history of Oklahoma. And so we're just trying to make sure that all the people of Oklahoma, it's also being in, in, integrated into the history of Oklahoma. And so I'm so glad to see you here, and thank you for taking the time. And later on, I'm gonna tell you more about of what I do, but something that I get really excited about, it's I am the chismosa with facts. <laughs> I get to tell the story, support it with evidence and the, the history behind it. And so in, in this picture, for example, we have one of the maps from when the expedition of Fran Francisco Vasquez de Coronado was done in the 1500s. So there are records where especially people from Mexico, was traveling through Oklahoma and in the Panhandle area. So when, when they say that we just arrived or the newcomers, well, let me tell you, it was about 400 plus years. And then we also have some records of the book, The Mexicans in Oklahoma, that are, uh, the book, it's called The Mexicans in Oklahoma by Michael W. M. Smith. Between 1917 and 1921, there was a total of 72,862 Mexicans legally entering the United States as temporary workers. By 1930, the U.S. had legally admitted 678,000 immigrants. Oklahoma reflected the national trends. They worked mainly in the coal mines for the Santa Fe, Frisco, Rock Island, and Katy Railroads, as well as in the agricultural and ranching areas. Other types of employment included meatpacking houses, oil fields, quarries, and other unskilled positions in industry and municipal services. So if you haven't read that book yet, I highly recommend it because it has lots of history in it. And so that says that also Mexican passports were not required but until 1918. So in 1921, during Governor James Robertson's administration, the Mexican government opened a consulate in Oklahoma City, whose first consul was Jose Montemayor, and this office remained in service until the mid-1960s. Um, this is the picture of the latest consul that we had in December of 1962, Victor Pesquiera. So that the jurisdiction uh, was taken over by Dallas and they was transferred over to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. The, then on June 17 of 2017, more than 55 years later, the government of Guatemala opened another consulate office from a Latin American country in Oklahoma. However, through this time, mobile consulate visits and honorary consular officers from Mexico and different countries were also approved to exercise meaningful consular functions on a regular basis and come under the supervision of and be accountable to the government which he or she represents with the approval of the U.S. Department of State. So that was a fast run history all the way to today because today I would like to acknowledge the, the presence of in the, in the audience of Dr. Amelia Miranda, she's the Honorary Consul of Spain in Oklahoma. And I'll uh, welcome our, one of our panelist guests, Attorney Enrique Villar Gambetta, if you can. If you go ahead and please have a seat. Enrique Villar um, Gambetta, he's the Honorary Consul of Peru, and also the chair of the Oklahoma's Governor's International Team. Mr. Villar has an extensive curriculum of international, commercial, and educational agreements between Latin, Amer Latin American countries and Oklahoma, including the Potawatomi Nation. On May 20 of 2023, you know that the new Mexican 
consulate office was inaugurated in Oklahoma City under the leadership of the head consul of Mexico, Edurne Pineda. Please welcome Ms. Edurne Pineda. Mrs. Pineda is a Mexican diplomat with a 25-year career specialized in consular affairs. Her academic background includes a bachelor's in economics and a master's in diplomatic studies. She has served as Deputy Consul General in Chicago, Atlanta, and Dallas, serving in every aspect of the services by the consulate offices and with vast experience in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. I could go on and on about historical records and telling you all about this amazing people. However, today, my dear friend and colleague, Cynthia Allen, accepted to be the moderator for today. So if you want to join us. She is the president and, she's the president and founder of CLA Consulting Solutions LLC, and also the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at Arvis Bank, where she is responsible of developing the strategy and execution of workforce, community engagement, and market influence across all bank divisions. Formerly the Chief Diversity and Equity Officer for the City of Norman, and an adjunct professor at the University of Oklahoma in the Department of Human Relations. Among several accolades and recognitions, Cynthia is a graduate of the Norman Police Department Citizens Police Academy, Leadership Norman Class 22, Leadership Oklahoma Class 31, and a lifetime member. She's an alumna of the University of Oklahoma, Cornell University, the National Diversity Council, and is currently pursuing a master's in public administration back at the University of Oklahoma, and she's a native of Chihuahua, Mexico, and a proud mother of three beautiful daughters. So thank you, thank you so much for being here and I'm gonna leave it up to you, Cynthia. Thank you so much. Um, okay, sorry, I'm gonna go back and forth. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just trying, to, trying to see both of you. You wanna, you wanna switch? Let's go, I'm I think so, sure. yeah, that way, okay. sorry. There's some teamwork, we've got teamwork here. Um, so thank you so much for being here today and thank you all so much for filling this room today. Um, you know, there's something really special about what we're seeing in Oklahoma and I think it definitely takes the collaboration of community. It takes the effort of support systems, whether that's nonprofits, of course, government, and just even our intergovernment relations with other nations as well um, to represent uh, the people that make up Oklahoma. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Muchas gracias por estar aquí a los que, que vinieron y por uh, tener a cabo este evento que celebra lo que es Oklahoma en este momento. Uh, nuestra población ha cambiado de, definitivamente y ha crecido y todo es en parte yo creo que por el apoyo que nos damos unos a otros. Así es que muchas gracias a ustedes por estar aquí. Um, well, let's get started and thank you so much again. Um, so, Consul Pineda y Consul, uh, perdón, Villar Gambetta, uh, disculpe. Uh, platíquenos un poquito de cómo ha sido la historia eh, de ustedes llegar aquí y formar su equipo en Oklahoma y también los servicios que uh, quedan a cabo en sus áreas. Um, so tell us a little bit about your story and how you've been able to set up your, uh, your establishment with the consulate as well as what services uh, are given through your consular offices. To go first. Okay, it's good. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Gracias por esta invitación. Eh, muy contento de estar con ustedes eh, por el interés que tienen hacia, hacia nuestra cultura, hacia nuestras ideas. Uh, well, um, how I appear in this scenario? Let me tell you something very fast. So this didn't happen 2011. So I was appointed by the president of Peru in that moment. Uh, the President of Peru uh, received a proposition, a proposal from the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Peru. And then uh, they presented the documents to the State Department in Washington, D.C. They uh, made a very strong uh, background check. They checked everything, everything. 
And I remember this, uh, something anecdotical. Someday, my partner told me in the, the office here, hey, two guys came here and asked me a lot of things about you and about my office. It's real, blah, blah, blah. It's a secret service. So they need to know who is going to be the person who is going to do these things. But the, the thing is, uh, uh, the honorary consul has, according to the Vienna Convention and internal rules uh, uh, in the Office of Foreign Affairs in Peru, we have very de defined uh, things that we can do. Uh, in fact, uh, our case so uh, for, for Peruvian uh, consulate is, is limited. Why? Because we are a small population here. So I am in charge of uh, all, all cases in, in uh, inmates. So I, I go with the people when the pro uh, deportation process starts. So uh, that, that is a more sensitive uh, moment than we have because we need to check out all the human rights. So all the details about the treatment and everything with the, with the inmates. But normally we can help. We work in a very close contact with the office in, in Dallas. We have another consul, uh, consulate there. Is, is, uh, they have a full team. I have, uh, my team is me here. Um, I, I, I work in a law office here. I am a Peruvian attorney. I am more involved in international law. So um, I work for this position with my team in Peru. I have my law firm in Peru for the last 27 years. So for that reason, I, 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 I get extra help from them. So. But anyway, we can do more things like that when we receive a special, uh, as, like uh, documents, like uh, IDs, like passport, but only if we receive a special request from the consulate in Dallas. But normally we attend, um, so the main thing is inmates. Then uh, elections and or when, when something happened, very hard things like, uh, uh, Debt. You know, we, we need to be the contact with, with the family and, and Peru. We help them here uh, in the hospital, in the medical examiner, all, all this kind. Right now we have one case. It's very sensitive, very, it's very sad, but it is what it is. So we are there always for help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I am the Consul of Mexico in Oklahoma. Even though we're based in Oklahoma City, we cover the entire state, and I would like to acknowledge that today uh, the entire staff of the Consulate of Mexico in Oklahoma is here with us. Uh, first of all, due to the very kind invitation of the Oklahoma History Center, Sadie Herrera. Uh, thank you, Sadie. And also to the sponsorship of Harvest Bank, so thank you, Cynthia. Uh, but we really wanted, we are a team of 35 people. We are five members of the Diplomatic um, Foreign Service, Mexican Foreign Service. Uh, four of them are, we are here. Uh, uh, Silvia, Claudio, and Carlos are my co-workers, my colleagues. And Angelica had to stay at the consulate because somebody had to be there for emergencies, you know. So it's five of us from the Mexican Foreign Service and 30 locally uh, hired local employees. So in total, we're 35. Not everybody's here, but probably 30 of us are here uh, because we really wanted to take this opportunity to come uh, to this beautiful center and learn more about Oklahoma, your history. And that is um, one of the main things a consulate does. Um, you know, the, the government of Mexico has developed a very strong and wide uh, consular policy in the U.S. because, as you know, we have a large community which is not growing uh, in the sense of having new Mexican immigrants in the U.S. The balance is pretty much zero. It was actually a little bit negative be before COVID, and now it has settled into, you know, a pretty much a balance. The same amount of people migrate from Mexico to the U.S. than those who go back to Mexico. Uh, but the community is growing because of the children, because of second and third generation Mexicans. Um, but before, I mean, in, during the past two, three decades, the community was growing. So the government of Mexico developed a very strong consular policy to serve this community. 
and also because this community kept very strong ties with Mexico, social, cultural, and economic. Uh, our migrant community sends back to Mexico billions of dollars in remittances every year. These remittances spread out in small amounts of around $300, $400 throughout millions of families in Mexico. So the economic uh, impact this migrant community also has in, in everyday life in Mexico is very relevant. So for many reasons, the government of Mexico was very much interested in continuing having a very strong relationship with this community, and that's why my government, our government, developed a very strong, again, consular policy and work in the US. So Mexico has the largest consular ne network in the world in one single country. Before Oklahoma City, we used to be 50 consulates, 51 if you also count the consular section, section in the embassy in Washington, DC. And now we are 52, 53, because this past Saturday, a, a new Mexican consulate was inaugurated in New Brunswick, in New Jersey. So we opened our doors on May the 20th. And since then, I am very happy to say that this wonderful team has become super productive to the point where the appointments we are able to offer do not fill up. Uh, we do have a call center that we do not administer. It is administered in Mexico City, which is a little bit tricky to navigate. But uh, the, the supply the, of services is there. This is, again, a very productive consulate that is up and running 100% in all the areas, which include documentation. We offer over 30 services only in the documentation area. We're seeing in between 200 and 300 people every day walking through our doors. Uh, we also have a protection department headed by Silvia Segovia right here with us, where we give legal advice to our nationals. We orient them we, just by talking to them and trying to understand what their situation is and helping them understand themselves what they are going through is a big advantage. And then we we are beginning to work in building up alliances with law firms um, so we can um, refer cases to, to these law firms because we do not practice the law here in the US even though we do have knowledge and we can advise our nationals, we do not practice the law here, but we do partner with law firms. And even in some cases, the government of Mexico may uh, invest some resources in defending some of these cases. Uh, for example, Enrique was men mentioning uh, when a national dies, we do work with the transfer of remains back to Mexico. We issue the Mexican death certificate. There's many different services and aids we can provide to our community. We also have the Community Affairs Department headed by Cla Claudio, uh, whom is also here, that has a preventive focus. We have three main programs there, the health, financial education, and education in general. We have windows uh, that talk to our customers, to the people coming through the consulate every day. Uh, regarding all these preventive programs, we sign MOUs with local allies. We want to build up strong alliances with different organizations and institutions here in Oklahoma. That's what we are invested on every single day. Consul Carlos Padilla, our deputy consul, is here also with us. Uh, we call him the uh, living encyclopedia. He knows so many things. So I bet you knew about the consul in Oklahoma City back in 1962, but I didn't know. Did you know? You didn't know? OK. I'm glad I was not the only ignorant one. So, Sadie, Sadie, you really enlightened us because we didn't know. Thank you so very much, and I would really appreciate having the opportunity to, to read the book you just mentioned because we didn't know there was a consulate of Mexico in Oklahoma City before. We were not aware of that. Um, of course, there is a consulate of Mexico now because there is a growing migrant community in Oklahoma, over 400,000 people uh, to the day. We were just this past weekend in Gaimon. We have a pretty active mobile unit that has been to Tulsa many, well, several times already. We're going to go to Enid as well very soon. We were in Gaimon with the help of our super friend, very close friend, Terry Mora. Thank you. Uh, this past weekend with a very successful visit. 
um, with Consul Padilla and Consul Segovia. And we're going back on December because our appointments there filled up like this. I mean, we know the demand is out there, uh, but we also believe that our community, not everybody is aware that we are fully operating now. And again, uh, navigating our call center is a little bit tricky, although you can do the appointment through WhatsApp as well. So if you have Mexican friends, just let them know. Um, but that's basically the introduction to the consulate. We have a, another leg uh, within the consulate, which I believe is pretty much what a, a honorary consulate also does, which is promotion. We are building up that area. And that's very relevant uh, for many different reasons. Mexico, I don't know if you know, but Mexico is the main trading partner to the US, the main trading partner to the US. So Mexico is not only migrants. Mexico is trade, is economic um, activity, economic benefit to the US as well. Um, and, and we have a very strong cultural exchange. There is a large, very large uh, American community or community of American citizens in Mexico, which is actually growing. We also issue visas for American citizens who want to move to Mexico. Um, so there's many ways we can collaborate and we're gonna have to continue collaborating. Um, security, uh, drugs, crime, there are so many border, the border, so many things that Mexico and the US have to work together, have to continue collaborating around or in. And the consulate of Mexico and Oklahoma City also has a purpose of helping both societies build up a strong, stronger di dialogue. As we said at the inauguration, we want Oklahoma to understand Mexico better and Mexico understand Oklahoma better. We want to build bridges and that is one of the main purposes of having a consulate of Mexico here as well. Thank you so much. So did you all catch all of that? So there, there's a lot of services that are provided um, and I think it's really interesting, uh, Consul Villargamberta, that you mentioned that uh, you know the population of the Peruvian nationals in Oklahoma is not as large do you think that having more uh, visibility to Latinos in uh, in the U.S. there's 20 percent or so of uh, of Latinos in the U.S. total in Oklahoma, almost 12 percent. So the numbers are definitely significant. Um, do you think that having more consulate presence from various countries, such as Spain as well, um, helps to? provide more visibility and helps for nationals to be able to uh, be represented in a stronger manner? Yes, sorry. <laughs> yes, I think uh, if we could have more, more positions, more consulate here, we can do, I mean, not only Peru, more countries here. Why? Because we help a lot in business, to Peru, so one example, so at the very beginning when I started this, this position, so I, I was in charge of the free trade agreement for Oklahoma, so there is a special chapter, the name is government procurement. That thing, it's very interesting because it helps the, the companies from Oklahoma act in Peru like a Peruvian companies. In where? In public operations and vice versa. Peruvian companies can act like American companies here in Oklahoma, like American corporations. But it means that the country, I mean, the state need to sign a special document to do that. And I bet uh, Oklahoma could have more mobility with, with more consulate, yes. In fact, we have a lot of commercial movement in Oklahoma uh, with other countries that they don't have consulate here, like Denmark. They are going to have today, Christy, today we are going to have uh, a visit of a delegation from Denmark. Next month we are going to receive a delegation from Uruguay. The thing is, uh, Peru, uh, we have a, a small group of people here. We think we are almost around maybe 4,000, maybe. Uh, it's, it was very, very difficult to identify uh, how exactly we are because we are all over the state. So uh, that's the reason that we, we don't have more service for them because they are weak and I have nothing to do. 
So, I, well, I have to do, but I, I mean, <laughs> I am in my office doing my own, own uh, job and in contact with my, I, I normally work with my office here and my office there. So I am busy, but the thing is, I, weeks, nothing happened. And uh, it's a curious thing. At the very beginning, when I started the position, we don't have Mexican consulate here. And we had, and you remember that, yes. there is an old, uh, it's a rule, it's like a treaty or something, uh, in place that Peru don't have consulate, but Mexico, yes. Uh, yes, you are going to help us, and vice versa. Yes. And the thing is, I received a lot of phone calls from Mexican uh, citizens. And then, well, it says, this is not yet enforced, but uh, let me, so we talk. Thank you, thank you for <laughs> no, helping. You're very welcome. <laughs> But yes, this, this thing helps a lot. And obviously we are here to serve, to help as much as we can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, and thank you too for enlightening us in regards to how, you know, we really have a, a global um, just opportunity, right? I mean, so you've mentioned this Alliance of the Pacific where I, you're able to help other nationals uh, where maybe their own consulate is not present. Um, I think having more awareness of these resources is so important, and that's something that you're asking for, right, Consul Pineda, that, you know, how do we make the awareness of our consulate offices um, known to the Latino community, and not just to the Latino community, I think just overall, because we have a really strong network in Oklahoma of, um, of being supportive, of, you know, just really having resources that, uh, that interact. So, um, you know, you have a room here full of people that represent various organizations. I got to meet, you know, folks from the Regional Feed ba Food Bank, Jerry, you're over there. Um, we've got colleges and universities that are represented. We've got corporations as well. Um, how can we help to drive more of the messaging of your services out in the communities uh, that many of these individuals serve? Oh, there's, you know, thank you. First of all, this is a wonderful room. Thank you all for being here. And thank you again to the Oklahoma City uh, uh, History Center for hosting. Um, well, we have felt so very much welcomed since we opened. And uh, I should mention that one of the main champions of having a consulate of Mexico here was Governor Stitt. Um, there's a couple of sheriffs that we have knocked, um, you know, we have tried to talk to, and at the beginning they were not really that open to talk to us because some people think that the consulate is gonna be annoying or a problem. Or, and that is part of our work, to try to open these channels and try to, again, help everybody understand that a consulate is only going to be positive to the work every single organization does. We are invested in procuring a better development for our community. And this community is a very important member of your society. So their future is linked to Oklahoma's future. The economy of Oklahoma is growing and you need, you need workers. I remember Governor Stitt at the State of the State address saying, Oklahoma is going to continue growing, its economy is going to continue growing and we don't only need more engineers or doctors or physicians, we need plumbers and tr truck drivers and gunners. And, and I thought, well, you need more Mexicans. I mean, <laughs> you need more workers. And um, it's troublesome to see what's happening at the border, how chaotic things have become. And I really would like to take the opportunity to mention that it is also a problem for, for Mexico. I mean, um, the US is such a strong, economic pool uh, and, and the people who migrate to the US do not live out of social security. Everybody works really hard. Nobody helps them. They have to work two, three jobs just to you know, make they seen and, and, and they don't only come and work really hard but they save enough to send back to their family. So these are entrepreneurs. These are brave, creative, hardworking people. We, had, we were commenting the other day at the table that actually in Mexico you could stay and make a life. I mean, Mexico has its challenges, but we are also understaffed. We also need workers. There are like above a million 
uh, working places that are not being filled every year in the service sector and those kind of jobs. Uh, so we also need more workers. I mean, it's not like the economy of Mexico is collapsing and there's no uh, way to have a life in Mexico. So people who make the decision to migrate, it's just because they want an even better life, an even better possibility to help, help their families. So these are the migrants you're getting here. And of course, I only talk about Mexico because I represent Mexico, but I'm sure it is pretty much the case with all the other migrants. And I, on the other hand, I also understand how local societies can be challenged by the situation at the border and how little control there seems to be. This only speaks from my point of view to the urgency to have a, an immigration reform that puts some more order to all this situation. And the same happens, for example, with crime and drugs. Uh, I, you know, I have made, um, a discipline myself to speak about this very spooky uh, issue every time that I can because at the other day I, I was at a table where somebody told me, well, yes, the US and Mexico keep on blaming each other because of the drugs problem. And I was like, no, Mexico doesn't blame the US. We understand we have responsibility, but we don't like the US blaming everything on us and some political actors even uh, saying that they're going to bombard us because of the drugs problem. Uh, and I really keep on asking myself, how would that, how would that work? How would you bombard whom? Uh, in which spot just to solve all the problems? I mean, is the problem only in the Mexican side? What happens with the drugs when they cross the border to this huge territory, which is four or five times Mexico? Who distributes the drugs? Who sells them? Who money launders all the money that you know you get out from selling these drugs? So this is a binational problem, and we want to help from the consulate to build up strong, a stronger dia dialogue and, and a stronger understanding uh, about these challenges we face together. But again, uh, going back to 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 the point uh, to to the beginning of. of of my intervention, it was uh, local authorities like Governor Steed and Mayor Holt, Mayor Bynum, who, who championed having a consulate of Mexico here because they know that the services we provide are very positive to the community. And one of the positive impacts we can have is uh, precisely building up alliances with all your organizations to try to get these services and these benefits closer to our community. Our community trusts us when they come to the consulate, so they listen to the messages they hear in the consulate. Uh, we do have resources uh, to put together workshops, to go out to the media, and, and get these services closer to them. So that's how I believe we could help and we could, uh, again, continue working with your organizations. Yeah, thank you so much. Consul Villar? Well, you touch uh, very sensitive things there, and uh, that's right. So um, I, I see every day, uh, so this is one small example. So when, uh, when kids from our countries want to be here, uh, to study in universities, there is one sensitive problem in, in the embassies. Too much time to get the visa, the student visa. And the problem is they, they lost the, the year, the academic year. So maybe, consul, we can help. Maybe we can suggest something. I, I am not saying we are going to interfere, no. Not by a second. Only suggestions how to do this better. I know they want to, to do better things, but we need to help in, in that side. And in the other, the other thing that, that we see here, well, I see that almost every day. There is a lot of uh, problems that we have here uh, because the people who move, so the coyotes is the name. And this guy, this is not only uh, illegal immigration, we're talking about their money laundering, as you said, human trafficking, we said drugs, weapons, etc. So this is a micro, micro clima, you know, to, to give more chance to more crime. So I think consuls 
who are in contact with people can say that, can explain that. Maybe it's a small contribution that we can give to our authorities here because they need to know what's going on here. And you know what? The, that people, the, the coyotes, coyotes or whatever, they are still working here with other agents. And these are like normal people, but I in connection with, with, that, with them. And they get for you all the documents that you need to be here. Social security documents, green cards, etc. So they, they, they get everything. And this is, a, this is a felony, this is a big crime. But the thing is, for that reason, I, I, I bet we can, we can help a lot in that matter. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, you both touched on a lot of, as you mentioned, very sensitive topics, but I think it's there are topics that also really impact um, the Latino community, not just in Oklahoma, uh, but across the country, because I think it really influences the perception um, that, uh, that non-Latinos have on uh, immigrants and on the influence that uh, Latin Americans have for the U.S. However, I think whenever we look at specific data that shows the contribution of Latinos, particularly for Oklahoma, um, data shows that from 2001 to 2022, there was a 114% increase of Latino labor workforce in Oklahoma as compared to less than 5% of just the general uh, labor workforce. So that comparison is just huge. Um, so with that, you know, you've mentioned the influence of Latinos in Oklahoma of the ability for your consuls to be able to help provide um, services, solutions. Um, tell us a little bit more about maybe some also misunderstandings in regards to services. Um, do you all offer any type of immigration related services or what's your partnership with the US Citizenship and Immigration um, Services offices federally? Sure. Well, yes, there is some mis misunderstanding. I have gotten the, the question of, okay, you're opening a consulate of Mexico, so now you're going to be able to fix the papers of all the illegals. <laughs> and no, not really. Uh, we, we cannot do that. We are not a, an immigration authority in the US, but we can, as I explained before, talk to our nationals and guide them. And of course, we are uh, in the effort of building up alliances with law firms, which are crucial for our for our work. So um, we do invest a lot of efforts and resources as well on that. And we also invest time uh, and energy on building up working relations with the different agencies, government agencies that foresee immigration affairs, Homeland Security and all its different departments. And they do see us as allies as well. I mean, people who get to know the consulate, for example, let's. Let's think about a mother who is deported and who has children, who are also American citizens. What does immigration do with that family? The consulate can jump in and help. There are so many different instances. Um, I was listening to a congressman yesterday on TV because everybody's worried about the border. And he was talking about installing uh, flights back to the ori original countries of the people of undocumented. Well, we had that program before, like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, only to Mexico. Uh, because first of all, to, to be able to do that, you would need to identify the name and nationality of the person you're flying back. Because if you don't know who or she is, where are you flying that person back to? So for example, for that kind of pro program, where you want to send people back to their original place in Mexico, let's say you would need the consulate of Mexico in that area to get papers um, uh, from about that person, verify his or her identity and nationality, and just get the paperwork uh, going. We did have a very successful program back in, uh, in between 2000, 2010 from Tucson, Arizona, where we used to have two or three flights back to central uh, locations in Mexico with Mexican migrants. Because I, I missed the, the track a little bit in my last intervention, but, but I was gonna say that for Mexico, the crisis at the border is also a big problem. And we don't like to see our people leaving. We don't like to see Mexicans leaving Mexico. 
We, again, we have uh, work positions that need people. Uh, we don't want these very val valuable people to leave the country. And this is a completely different matter for what we are seeing today regarding human trafficking, just what Enrique mentioned. That is a huge problem for Mexico. These are human beings that are being systematically abused by these uh, human traffickers. And all this is related to the immigration system in the US uh, and the inability, sorry to say, that the country has had to resolve this situation because you're such a powerful economy. And don't forget, every single people who, who comes here do actually get a job. Mm -hmm. There's jobs here. And people get hired. And people who hire them know that they are undocumented. So this is like a vicious circle. Um, but yes, we do build up alliances with immigration authorities, and they do find our support and participation very, very useful. Well, thank you. Okay, um, yes, uh, so we cannot interfere with the internal rules about immigration. The only thing that we do, which is very strong, is we're watching. We, we check all the, everything by the book, so no, no excess, nothing, everything fine. And then we provide for that reason, at the very beginning I told about the deportation process, so we help and we, 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 are, we we are with them. We visit them, and then we start two, three days with them until uh, the people abandon the, the, the state. Because uh, in the past, they moved first to Dallas with, uh, with uh, two, two agents, and then they go back to Lima. The thing is, so we watch that, and then uh, only that, that situation. We are not doing uh, nothing to let's say, be an attorney of them. We are not allowed to do that. We provide a pool of attorneys. And then in other things, like, uh, let's say, my expertise is, is business, is commercial things. So we give, we, we give advice. We suggest them how that is the way to do business here. How can you move uh, this product, that product? How can you prepare things? And you know what? There is very interesting groups here and I am going to mention Oklahoma Governors International Team. I am honored to be part of that team. Uh, this, this year, we start to do something with uh, Latin America countries. Why? Because if you check the geopolitical uh, situation in, in Latin America, you will see a lot of uh, intromission of uh, communist groups, Cuba, G2 of Cuba, so Intel Service, China, Russia, and then there is, uh, there is a possibility of companies of that, of that countries to be here. But they are very uh, aware and worried about the immigration rules. Nobody explained them, so you need to explain them that they can play with L1 visa or investment visa or et cetera. There's too many ways. But the thing is, uh, we're doing something, yes. And we want to do more, yes. Thank Very good. You. Thank you so much. Um, well, as I mentioned, and by the way, um, you know, a couple of times Consul Pineda has mentioned the request for partnerships out with, uh, with legal teams, et cetera. I do know we have a table out here of um, federal uh, defenders, so got to meet them earlier, so make sure that you all sure. connect. Thank you for being um, here. We also have several of our education um, partners out here. So we have SNU, Southern Nazarene University, Rose State College, uh, the University of Oklahoma, and perhaps several others. So on the note of education, um, how do your consul offices help to advance and promote education for your connationals? Okay. Um, yes. So we, we got in the last year several agreements with different universities. We have uh, agreement with OSU, UCO, uh, Tulsa University, uh, OU, and similar number of universities in Peru, like five or six universities and uh, technical institutes. So we help them. As I mentioned at the very beginning, so I have the luck to have my team in Peru because when I go there, 
uh, I try to push these relations. Uh, but the thing is, I, I stay there like one week, two weeks, most of the time, it's no more than that. But somebody needs to follow up. So I have my, my tigers there, so they help me. And that's uh, the only reason that we got several agreements. Uh, at this point, we have six with universities, one uh, with a technical institution, Oklahoma State University Technical Inst Institute is the name, and Senati, which is the biggest entity in Peru. And the other uh, big, big public uh, entity that we have is Pronavec. What is Pronavec? Pronavec is a Peruvian entity to give the money, to give the funds for scholarships. So we, we had uh, agreements with, uh, with universities. The last one was with OU. So for, for students, so that's the way that we can help and, and, and we do that then. The other, the other thing that we have is, is relations with cities. So we, we achieve uh, two, two cities from Oklahoma, Oklahoma City with Piura, which is a very north of, of Peru, close to the border with Ecuador. And the other city is uh, Edmond and Miraflores in Peru how this thing works and how this thing help. Because the, 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 character, the, 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 the picture is you have in that agreement, you have cultural things and you have university in that city. You have touristical events, touristical uh, back and forth uh, possibilities and economy with the Chamber of Commerce. So that thing is a perfect vehicle to do agreements to do business and connect people. It's the civil diplomacy. Uh, so we, we, are, we are in that as well. And, and I think that is that. That's great. Some very strong partnerships, for sure. Consul Pina? Sure. Before talking about education, I would like to point out to what Enrique said about the connections. That cons that's what I was referring to, bridges, and how important. Um, and it all depends on how active the consulate is, but we're both very active consulates. But you can uh, make a lot of connections and help things happen. One of the things that we are also paying attention into and working into is uh, trying to have international flights from Oklahoma to Cancun and Cabo and Mexico. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> but that would definitely benefit anybody else. Uh, no, but one of the things that really amazed me, amazed us, when we moved to Oklahoma, apart from the beauty of your state and the richness and the potential of your state, because it is amazing, really. Things are just, the table is just set for wonderful things to happen. Uh, but one of the things that really surprised me was that you don't have international flights. So I was like, why? How is this possible? I, I, the sense that I personally have is that you were comfortable with that, that you didn't want to open up that much that you wanted to keep Oklahoma as a jewel to yourself. Uh, and I feel like the, the feeling is changing and the attitude is changing towards opening up. Uh, and that's why you championed having a consulate of Mexico here. So we, I, I totally agree with Enrique. We, we work on building bridges and connections. Um, and talking about education, going back to our community affairs department, the main, I would say we have different programs. The most um, relevant one, because it's the one that touches the most people, is the education window that we are actually working in putting together. We do have two windows which are already running, and when I say window, I mean front desks in our documentation area. So the, the representatives from different agencies do have direct access to our nationals every day. The flow of people coming through our doors every day. People who are actually waiting there for two or three hours to get their passports or their documents. So they are there, they don't have anything else to do. So they do pay attention and again they trust the consulate. So we do have two windows already running, the health window with the Latino agency. Salvador is here, thank you for partnering with us. And we have the financial education window with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So these two windows are already running and we have a coordinator every day at the consulate doing this work. 
The coordinator also connects with different agencies on each field to invite you to come over to the consulate and talk to our nationals, do workshops, etc. And we are putting together our education window. So we're going to sign an MOU with an, an educational institution. We have a couple of candidates already. They are reviewing the MOU we need to sign to have a coordinator at the consulate to talk to our nationals about how to navigate the educational system of the US in the best way possible, mainly for parents to know how to help their children in the best way possible. It is very difficult when you come from a different culture to understand how to apply to colleges, how to get financial aid, what FAFSA is, and this and that. So I, I am the mother of two teenagers. One is already in college. The second one is going to be hopefully next year in college. And it was very difficult for me. It was very difficult for me to understand, for my husband and myself to understand how it worked. It was very difficult since kindergarten, to be honest with you. Because the way you, you talk to the teachers, the way the system works, the grading system, everything is different from Mexico, from what we lived. So if we do have a good educational level, and it was challenging for us, we can only imagine how difficult it is for our migrant families to understand how to navigate the educational system in the US the best way possible. So that is the intent of this window. And again, we're working on, on having it run uh, since the beginning of next year. That's the goal. Um, we have another couple of programs. One is IME Becas. Uh, it's our scholarship fund that is funded by the government of Mexico, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we look for matching funds. Uh, we did have a pilot program this year because we're a um, new consulate. Teddy Mora was one of our um, committee members. Thank you, Teddy. Um, uh, we had small funds this year. Hopefully next year we're going to have more funds. But we did open um, the invitation to different uh, education institutions. Tulsa Community College won. So they did get these funds this year. This year. And the government of Mexico, of course, funds programs that benefit Mexican uh, students or, or students of Mexican origin, um, favoring undocumented Mexican students, because they are the ones who are more challenged to look for financial aid. And third, uh, the third leg in, within the education scope would be to, as Enrique explained, uh, build up alliances between universities to procure a larger um, exchange of students, of foreign students. Mexico is challenged by the idea that we are unsafe. Many people don't even want to visit Mexico because they believe it is dangerous. We are very much aware of the propaganda of the image that is every single day uh, shown on TV here in the US. And we also want to not challenge, but you know, uh, provide additional information for people to try to understand our reality better. There are certain points in Mexico that are probably not that safe, but most of the country is very safe. And we have wonderful places to visit, and places where you can live very happily and very safely as, as long as you're sensitive and you know you, you don't take uh, silly risks. But um, there is a sisterhood uh, that, for example, Oklahoma City has with Puebla. And within the scope of this sisterhood, sisterhood universities like uh, OSU have built up alliances with Mexican universities to create these exchanges. And it would be so great to have more international students going to Mexico and Mexica, Mexican students coming to Oklahoma because that's the best way to learn about both societies, to understand what Oklahoma is, what Mexico is. And again, our future, futures are linked. There's no other way. I mean, the US needs to partner with Mexico, and Mexico, of course, needs to partner with the US. It is much better if we can understand each other better. So yes, we do work on this, and I am so glad to hear that a couple of universities are here at the table. Thank you so much for being here. And public defenders, we are working already with DHS. We also have several families whose kids are within the system. And again, there we can be allies. We don't want to counter say or counter attack or go against anything the judge 
or the department says, we just want to help our families understand what they are supposed to do in order to regain uh, custody of their children. Many times there are so many cultural barriers, uh, so the consulate can help our families understand better.